Hello, I'm Paul White, and in this Sound on Sound podcast, I'll be talking about delay and echo. Natural echo only occurs where there are reflective surfaces at a significant distance from the sound source, such as cliffs or the walls of canyons. Artificial delay was first explored by using a tape recorder to delay a signal by the time taken for the tape to move from the record head to the replay head. The time was short, perhaps as low as 70 milliseconds or so at a 15 inches per second tape speed, and there was just a single repeat. That was enough to create the familiar slapback effect that is still popular in rockabilly music today. Dropping the tape speed to 7.5 inches per second doubled the delay time. Here's an example of slapback echo. Slapback, slapback sounds something, sounds something like, like this. this. At the highest tape speeds, the effect was also used to create what we call artificial double tracking, or ADT. In effect, just a short slapback. Here's an example of ADT. ADT uses uses a shorter shorter delay and sounds something something like like this. this. Unless the machine had very speed, the only way of adjusting delay time was to switch tape speeds, but many classic records were made within these limitations. It was soon discovered that feeding some of the output back to the input created a repeating echo effect, like this. However, if the feedback level was set too high, the repeats would build up into an uncontrollable oscillation, an effect later exploited in dub music. Here's an example of runaway feedback. Of course, it didn't take long for engineers to come up with dedicated echo units, most based on a continuous loop of tape or an endless tape cassette running past a record head, followed by one or more playback heads. An erase head would then wipe the tape clean before it reached the record head again. One of the first commercial tape delays was the Maestro Echoplex, which had just one replay head. On this model, the distance between the heads could be adjusted to change the delay time. Other techniques were also explored, including the so-called oil can echo, where an electrostatic charge was recorded and replayed via a coated metal disc running inside a can of oil. Now, I have to say that one rather passed me by as I've never come across one, but I'm told that it sounded very lo-fi. Another simple alternative was the Cooper Time Cube, essentially a system that used a loudspeaker to funnel sound down a long length of garden hose that was picked up by a microphone at the other end, producing a rather murky and quite short delay. Perhaps the most successful early non-tape unit was the Benson Echo Rec, which used a rotating drum and multiple replay heads instead of tape, The edge of the drum was wound with a special wire to provide a recording surface. By switching the various playback heads on or off, multi-head machines like this can produce different rhythmic repeat patterns, though on this particular model the drum speed couldn't be changed. Here's what it sounded like. Because American musical gear was difficult to obtain in the UK during the 1960s due to restrictions on imports, many UK bands used the British-built Watkins Copycat tape echo unit hooked up to the guitar amp or to the PA system. This was a tape loop device launched in 1958 with one record head and three playback heads. The Copycat became a top seller internationally and went through several incarnations. In later years, the tape-based Roland Space Echo became very popular, combining tape loop echo with spring reverb. The main problem with any tape echo is that the tape loop wears out fairly quickly, and as it does so, the delays become less bright sounding. There's also a tendency for the rubber rollers to get misshapen with use, which introduces some unintentional pitch modulation. But for all these defects, tape delay actually sounded very musical, as the slightly softened delays don't conflict too much with the original dry sound, and the modulation due to the worn rollers just adds to the character. Of course, the tape would occasionally break or jam during a gig, and that wasn't such a good thing. (laughs) 
In the late 1960s, engineers found a way to do away with all those pesky moving parts. This was all down to the invention of the charge-coupled analog delay line, often referred to as a bucket brigade device. And it wasn't long before we saw solid-state echo units exploiting this technology. The first unit I can recall was the British-made Carl's Bromantis, released in 1970. In America, companies like MXR and Electro Harmonics went on to produce their own very successful solid-state delay pedals. Compared with tape, bucket brigade delays sound very dull, and the longer the delay time, the duller and noisier the sound becomes. A charge-coupled delay line relies on passing an electrical charge down a long line of cells. That's rather like a line of people holding buckets passing a quantity of water from one bucket to the next. So, the longer the delay line, the greater the signal deterioration. Later models improved on sound quality, sounding less noisy and slightly less dull, but they were still quite warm sounding, and as with worn tape loops, the progressively murky repeats sat comfortably behind the original dry sound. There are several classic units based on this technology that are still made today, including the endearingly popular Electroharmonics Memory Man. This model includes a modulation section to add either a chorus style effect or maybe a little tape style pitch wavering. The big leap forward came with digital delays and today they are much more affordable and offer a much higher audio quality than they did when they were first introduced. They utilise the same core converter technology as a digital recorder so getting a high quality sound is no longer a problem with 16 and 24 bit resolutions being commonplace. Early high quality digital delays included the Lexicon 1300S and the TC Electronic 2290, but soon all the major manufacturers came out with their own take on the effect, with the Korg SD3000 attracting some famous users, including U2's Edge. Boss also added digital delays to their pedal range, as did many other pedal manufacturers. As with charge coupled delays, there were spin off effects made possible by this technology too, such as chorus and flanging. Both these effects rely on a short delay combined with modulation, and in the case of flanging, also some feedback. <laughs> Many musicians look back fondly on the sound of tape and bucket brigade delay lines, so it's very common to find that today's digital units offer emulations of these old technologies, but without the attendant noise or the unreliability of tape. While the obvious examples of vintage tape echo users include the Shadows, the Ventures and of course Les Paul, those that followed, such as The Edge, David Gilmore and Brian May have created some wonderful and distinctive sounds based around their use of delay. Today we're inundated with delays of all kinds, varying from the very basic to fastidious emulations of specific vintage hardware, such as the Echoplex, the Space Echo, the Binson Echo Rec, and even the Cooper Time Cube. On some you can adjust the apparent age of the tape, and even the sound of the tape splice going past the heads in some cases. There are also emulations of vintage analog delays, most including separate modulation controls. Many modern versions also offer EQ of the repeats along with tempo sync options so that you can get the delays in time with the music when needed. There are also delays that include more complex modulation and filtering such as Papen's Del Sane plugin, an example of which can be heard here. <laughs> A novel feature found in many modern delays is the ability to create a backwards tape sound made possible by recording short sections of sound and then playing them back in reverse in place of the more normal delays. This was only made possible by digital technology. Here's a sound example.
Pedal and plug-in designers have really embraced the possibilities of digital delay combined with unexpected effects of their own choosing, opening up a large market for boutique pedals and strange plug-ins. Effects such as Output's Portal plug-in that combine reverse delays and elaborate modulation with elements of granular processing, a technique that involves manipulating very short segments of music to create interesting textures. Companies such as Meris and Red Panda have also produced pedals that can create extraordinary delay-based effects. Some of these pedals and plugins create such dramatic sonic transformations that they blur the line between effects and synthesis. Here are just a few examples applied to guitar. Well, that's all we have time for, but do visit soundonsound.com forward slash podcasts to hear more. Thank you for listening, and be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. Oh, and just before you go, let me point you to the soundonsound.com forward slash podcasts website page, where you can explore what's playing on our other channels. 